No, you and I, we live in a world today more connected than ever before. But as we read and as many people would argue, even though we live in a time when we're as a world more connected than we ever have been, so many of us today are experiencing disconnection. So many of us, regardless of age group or generation, are experiencing isolation and loneliness in a connected world. I have a friend who works as a counselor in his community, and he made the comment the other day, he said, you know, everybody I see just wants to come in and talk. And I said, well, I was kind of taken back by this comment because I thought that's what the job of a counselor was, was to sit there and kind of listen, you know? And he said, he said no, no. What I mean is they just want to come in and talk. They're not looking for an answer. They're not looking for a solution. But so many people are coming to him today just to have a face-to-face -face conversation, just to be with a person, a human. It's amazing to me that in our world, as connected as we are, we're becoming increasingly disconnected. And we're seeing that in our younger generation more and more than I think ever before. We're in the middle of a series we've titled Life in the Church. And in this series, we're looking at a passage of text from Acts chapter 2 and verses 38 and following. I would encourage you to please go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles there. Acts chapter 2. We're going to be looking at a few verses this morning as we continue this series. And this morning, as we think about uh, this series and, and what we have been studying through, what I want us to do today is to focus a few minutes of our time on this word fellowship. And we'll talk about that a bit more. But we're asking ourselves through this series, why is it that we do the things that we do? Why do we come and participate as a community uh, together in the things that we participate in. And so let's look at this for a moment. Let's read our text again. I know we've read it a few times. Uh, we're going to continue to read it through this series, but Acts chapter 2, as we begin in verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart praising God and having favor of all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, we talked about how Luke has arranged this text to highlight certain elements for us and how he's paralleling different things in the text. And for example, this word that we see here, uh, translated in our English Bibles as, as fellowship, it, it means an association, a community. It means a, a close relationship. And, and Luke is highlighting, I think, certain elements here. He's highlighting this community of early Christ followers as he's kind of showing us a design, a pattern for life in the church. He's focusing our attention as he puts these things in parallel. For example, we see uh, and, and the, the fellowship here is, is paralleled in, the, in uh, verses 44 and 45, if you look in your text. All believers were together and had everything in common. What Luke is doing is he's, he's taking this, this practice, this fellowship, and then he's giving us a little more understanding into that word. He's paralleling these things. And I believe he's doing so so that we as readers will, will slow down just a minute. I was thinking about this the other day, driving to work, you know, back with the old cars. You used to pump the brakes, right? Anybody remember having to pump the brakes up? 
I do. I had many cars you had to pump the brakes on. But that's what Luke's doing. He's, he's pumping the brakes. He's saying, slow down just a minute. And meditate on, reflect on what's happening here in the story of God. And he's trying to draw our attention to these things. So that word fellowship, it, it's a significant word. It's an association, a community, a close relationship. And as we look at the parallel text, Acts 2 and verses 44 and 45, he says, All believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. That word common there is, is closely related to the Greek word for fellowship. Uh, and it's, it's a word that means like communal or, or actually ordinary, something that's common, it's ordinary. Fellowship in the early church. And this is what I want us to see. Although it could have been a meal that they shared together, fellowship in the early church was much more than a potluck meal. So what does Luke intend for us to see? What is he drawing our attention to as he talks about this participation together in fellowship with one another? Now, I want to take us back in the story of God a bit. No, nope, we're not going to Genesis, um, but we could. I, you know, I was sitting there this morning and I thought I really should have gone to page one and two, but I decided for your sakes I would not. But, but think about this for a minute. <laughs> Sorry, I can't get away from it. What's one of the things that we read about in creation? Was God among his creation? Walking in the... There was fellowship. There was community in the garden. We're not going there. We're going to go to Exodus, but I could have gone there, right? I want to take us a little bit further ahead in the story, Exodus chapter 6, for just a moment. And in Exodus 6, this is where the Lord, this is where Yahweh is speaking to Moses, and he's, he's telling them, he's telling, sharing with Moses about him delivering Israel, delivering his children from bondage. Say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with outstretched arm and with great judgment. Now look, I want you to pay attention here. I mean, it's scripture, but... Focus in. We pay attention to the whole Bible, but notice the words of God right here. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Consider for a moment Israel who had been in bondage, enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. They'd been surrounded by a culture that was not theirs. They had been surrounded by an Egyptian culture. They have been surrounded by gods, the gods of Egypt, the Pharaoh and worship of the Pharaoh. And now God, Yahweh, is saying, I'm going to take you out of this land. I can only imagine that if it were me, I, I, you've been in this land. And now you're kind of asking some questions, who are we? What's our identity? Who, what's our history? What's my culture? Because I'm in a foreign land. What God do we serve? Can you, can you imagine the questions that would have gone through their mind after being embedded in a culture that was not theirs for 400 years? They would have had a lot of questions. And at Sinai, 
God joins himself in covenantal community with the children of Israel. What does he tell them? You're my people. I'm your God. What's he doing? He's forming an identity in those he has redeemed. He's forming a people out of those he's rescued from bondage. I can't remember how many years ago it was. It's been a couple of years ago at this point. Brenda and I, uh, she was studying with the girls, and I continued studying ancient law codes. I mean, it's just something we all study in our spare time, right? We all like to enjoy reading ancient law codes. Um, And it's been a while, so forgive me if I get any of this wrong. Uh, This was on the way to church this morning. I was thinking about this. But Hammurabi is one of the oldest law codes that, I, as I understand that we have, at least in a, one of the most complete law codes of the ancient Babylonian culture. And I remember when I was studying through these ancient law codes, one of the things that, that I discovered doing this was that these law codes were celebrated in ancient cultures. Now, we're used to being governed by laws in our day. We're used to having law codes and formal codes that that kind of govern our society and who we are. But that wasn't the case in the ancient world. And so these law codes, they were celebrated because they brought a sense of identity, they brought a sense of justice, and they were celebrated in their cultures. And what occurred to me as I read through this and was just thinking about this for myself is, you know, a lot of times we look back on the Hebrew, uh, the, the old covenant, if you will, and we, we think, man, what a burden that was. I mean, they had to do all this washing and these ceremonies, and, and man, I'm so glad that, you know, and I am glad that we live under the new covenant. But I think so many times in my mind, in our minds, what we do is we have such a negative view of God's covenant with Israel, the old covenant. When I think in actuality, it would have been celebrated. When David records in the Psalms, you know, I delight in your law. Meditate on the words of the Lord, Psalm chapter 1. They would have celebrated it. Why? Because it was for them an identity. It formed who they were as the people of God. It became who they were. It was them, their culture. Uh, As I was studying this, and and I'll get off this, I'm sorry, but as I was studying through this, I was reading and listening to another gentleman speaking about this topic, and and he, he related it in a way that just made so much sense to me. And I'd never thought about it quite like this. But, you know, we talked about Passover a bit as Jesus sat with his disciples. And sometimes we think, man, what, uh, what a burden to have to prepare and do everything this way. And, and this, this gentleman was explaining, you know, we do the same thing in our culture today. We just don't recognize that we do it. And as I drove up here this morning, I was thinking about, and this is what he was relating it to, Thanksgiving and Christmas, right? There is a lot of preparation that goes into Thanksgiving and that meal. There is weeks of planning that go into that meal, but it's a time that we come together as families and we enjoy enjoy, uh, the together and being together. We enjoy and celebrate being together as a family as we partake of that meal. And everything has to be done just right, right? Because if you've got too much sage in the dressing, you're not doing it right. Do you understand? You see, we look back and we think, what a burden that must have been. And I understand. Please don't misunderstand me. We are part of the New Covenant family of God. Amen. But I just think so often in our minds, we have this view of God's covenant with Israel that they didn't share. 
I think it was something they celebrated because it brought in them a sense of identity, a sense of purpose. They knew who they were. We, we worship the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the God we worship, not the gods of Egypt. So let's catch back up to Acts chapter 2 for a moment. I digress. But they devoted themselves to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. Now, life in the first century certainly differs from our life today. I understand that uh, their community, their life is different from ours. But they were devoted to one another. To the fellowship. Fellowship within the early church took on a tangible meaning. It was ingrained in their identity. It was ingrained in who they were. They shared a culture of not me, but we. And I believe what's happening here as I look at these things Luke talks about, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. As I look at these things, I think, what's happening here in the early church? It's the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. I don't know where we're at, sorry. Uh, it's the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. And so we're in Jerusalem, and, and there is a lot of people more than likely Jews who have heard the message of Peter and they're repenting of their sins. And as Peter says, tells them, hey, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift, the promise of the Holy Spirit. I can only imagine that they're sitting there as the disciples gather, you know, coming together now and saying, what does this mean? Who are we? And what they're doing is they're forming an identity. How are they forming that identity? Devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to prayer, to fellowship. This is becoming the covenantal community of God. This is who they are. It's not an activity. It's not something they did. It wasn't another busy thing in their lives. This formed who they are. And they were devoted to one another. They were devoted to the fellowship. And what that is, is it's a call for us today to live authentic lives, connected lives in the body of Christ, the family of God. Fellowship originates in God. It originates with God. It's the fabric of participation as life in the church. The church is a new covenant family, and they shared, they participated together in life. It was their identity. It's who they were. And I think about this at times. I just need to give up on our notes today. I think about this at times because so many times in church, right, we, we come together and, you know, why do we come together? Why do we assemble ourselves for worship together on the first day of the week? Well, Hebrews tells us don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So we've got a command to do that. And we want to be obedient to that command. I'm not taking anything away from that command. Please believe me. Why do we celebrate the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week? Well, we, we have the example of the New Testament community of Christ coming together on the first day of the week to break bread. Absolutely. Amen. But the design of this series and what I want us to see is it's so much more than a command. 
It's so much more than me just oblig obligatory, how do you say that word? Uh, <laughs> fulfilling a requirement. What I think Luke is trying to show us and what I want us to see is that we are joined to a history. And in that history is so much depth as to what we do when we come together and when we partake in fellowship. What I want us to see is that that's connected to the God that we serve. So am I honoring his word, his command? Absolutely. But why? Because it's forming in me an identity. It's much more than just keeping the command. It is keeping the command. But there's so much more than just keeping the command and crossing off the checkbox. I hope that hits home. That's not at all what I wanted to talk about this morning, but I, I hope in some way that relates. But let's, let's try to salvage this just real quick. And uh, I don't even know how long I've been talking. I understand that we don't live in the same context of the first century, right? We don't. And I know that, honestly, Bible teachers, and, and for a lot of times, we've had trouble with this passage, and we kind of shy away from it because, whew, that looks, you know, they were selling everything and giving together, and that just doesn't look like us at all. So we kind of just avoided that whole, sometimes, we've avoided that whole passage. But how can we take this, right? And take what Luke is sharing, which what Luke is sharing and, and the message that I think we need to get is, is it was a participation together. Life was together in the early church. They participated with one another. They were involved in the lives of one another, right? They knew the needs of the community because they were sharing life together. Now, somewhere in my notes, and, and I want to be clear here, what I'm not advocating is that we just go ahead and isolate ourselves and become some little private community that, that does not interact with their culture, but we're, we're together and we just want to huddle up and be together, right? That's not what Luke's talking about, okay? Some have tried that and some have done that. But if you notice in your text, verse 47, again, all over the place here, but uh, notice down there in verse 47, it records, Luke records for us, praising God and having favor with all people. Having favor with who? All people. You see, they weren't just isolated and huddled up in their own little community. They were engaged in their culture. And the Lord added to their number day by day. The Lord added to those who were being saved daily. The church was not disconnected the church was not exclusive. The clear church was engaged with one another and with their culture. So don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to say we need to all pull ourselves to the hills and huddle up here and isolate ourselves. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying as his church is that we need to be devoted to one another because it's forming in us an identity. So how, how can we practice this today? What steps maybe can we take to help us in forming this community for our lives today? Number one, participate in the community. Participate in the community. We talked about how the author of Hebrews says that it's, it's not something we're, we're to give up on. Participating together. Make it a priority to be present in the community of God. Make it a priority in your life. There's going to be times, we get it, when work's going to interfere with our schedules, when something's going to come up. I get that. That's understandable. But the community and the body of Christ needs to be a priority in our lives. And it needs to be a priority that's modeled for our younger generation. Second thing is this, participate in prayer. Practice prayer. Prayer should shape us as followers of Jesus. And prayer just doesn't need to be on Sunday morning. 
We might think about organizing prayer gatherings, times when we come together to pray for this community here at South Belt, to pray for the Lord's church, to pray for our neighbors. Participate in prayer. And the third thing I might recommend that just would help us in shaping and forming our identity together is practical steps of service and generosity. How can we support one another? What can we do here as a community? And how can we support and share with the larger community outside of these walls? Be dedicated to serving, to comfort, to participating with one another as the church. So here's the big point. Life in the church is connected in community. Life in the church is connected in community. Life in the church is fellowship. 